You're listening to the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. Where we talk about hunting, shooting, fishing, camping, and everything else that the great outdoors has to offer. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, welcome to the show tonight. Before we get into it, I've got some pretty exciting news. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a bit of a rut and raw, is what I'm calling it, and we're going to have stories. So we're just going to have people who have called in, got in contact, and they're going to tell us about some awesome fellow bucks that they've been able to get in previous years' ruts or their hunting journeys, and we're going to do the same for the raw. So that's going to be pretty cool, and that's going to come up in the next couple of weeks just to get everybody pumped up even more so for the upcoming Roar and Rut. So stay tuned in the next couple of weeks for that. They should be really, really good. Well, let's get into tonight's episode. It's a little bit different. There's some pretty cool things in there and a bit of hunting, bit of running, DU-135. Man, it's crazy. So let's get right into it. All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, we are, This is the first recording in January for me, and it's been a pretty wild ride, and we'll get into that in a second. But tonight, I've got Anthony from DU135. You might be wondering what that is. I found it by chance. I'm really glad I did because it is something that sparked my interest. So, Anthony, I'll throw over to you, mate. DU135, explain it to our listeners, mate. DU135 is a ultra run it is 135 miles through uh loaded air gorge it is crazy uh so 135 miles is 217 k's <laughs> the participants have got 56 hours to finish Damn. otherwise they get cut off yep and then there's there's uh other cutoffs along the way so i think you can get to 110 kilometers in 24 hours or 26 hours and then you've got to get back but that cutoff to return is if you're just aiming for that to to finish then you're not going to get there it's it's too it's too tight all right so i'm a sucker for punishment and i love pushing myself as far as i can go that does i've just hit 40 that just seems way out of the possibilities for me I'm sitting 200 odd kilometers. Man, that is, that's huge. <laughs> to, to put it in perspective, a marathon, which a lot of people will never do, is 42 kilometers. This is, oh, that, what's that? Six times more in one hit. That's, that's, a, that's just, I'm lost for words at how big that is. Yeah. I, well, we do get a lot of people that just try and have a go. Um, and like our finishing rate is about 16%. Wow. We've had um, a few people come and finish it a couple times. Um, I think that you know, once you've had a good crack at it, because the course changes every year as well, uh, you, you will have uh, one year you could be doing over 10,000 K vert. So like through the gorge, you will have – it's not high mountains. It's just like upper upper gorge. So you'll be going up, just in and out, like pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, single trail, uh, normal normal sort of walking trails as well. But then you'll be going some some off trails just to interconnect. And that they're, they're getting on on and off those ridges are just that's pretty nuts. It can get get pretty crazy. <laughs> so I've spoken about this before, and. One of the things, I know there's a lot of people that like CrossFit out there. I'm not super keen on it because I've had a lot of friends that have taken it up and got a lot of injuries. And that's on the back of doing weightlifting at speed to try and beat a clock or beat a time. So when fatigue starts to kick in, then we see poor form. Yeah. For me, thinking about doing 135 miles – and there's got to be a heap of fatigue coming in throughout that time, especially in what was it, 56 hours, did you say? Yeah. So a heap of fatigue 
Do you get many injuries on the back of that? Especially if you're going up and down gorges and most of the people here listening that have been out there that are hunters, that have probably hunted high country and gone up and down, I believe you're a bit of a hunter yourself. Yep. And it gets hard and it gets hard when you've got a pack on. Then when you're trying to run it, yeah, you might not have a pack. Or I'm guessing you'd have to have some water and things like that, wouldn't you, if you're doing it? Yeah. So you're carrying something. Yeah, there's some mandatory gear that you have to carry the whole time, like first aid kits and some phones and stuff like that. And, yeah, the water or potentially to be able to take water, so you, like an empty bladder that you could fill up on a stream or something if it's flowing. But, yeah, the, I haven't really heard too much of injuries afterwards. It's probably more, a lot of fatigue. It would take a few weeks to recover. God, yeah. But definitely these guys and girls that enter, they're not your starter. It's not not your starter kind of marathoners. Yeah, they've done to qualify. You have to do already a hundred kilometers, three thousand gain sort of. So it's it's already a fair, you're an established kind of runner. You know what you're getting into. Things like the UTMB in Sydney. Um, is it? No, is it Ultra Trail? Yep, I've heard of Ultra Trail. Yeah, the old North Face. If you do the hundred kilometers there, you can qualify. Um, like Gao, the Great Ocean Walk down along the coast on the Great Ocean Road. Yep. Uh, Alpine Challenge, they do uh, 100K and uh, I believe it's a miler, uh, 160Ks around Falls Creek. So like those kind of races generally have got to have one down before you come and do this because it's otherwise we're sort of asking people to be like uh, lamb to the slaughterhouse kind of thing. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we don't want to just take their money, but we want people, one or two people to finish. Well, I think, A, that makes sense because when you look at it, and I just, as I said before, 200-odd Ks going, Jesus, like I, um, I'm not a great runner. I do love running, and I try and do twice a week at least 10 Ks. And I sort of sit there and go, okay, well, that's, you know, 25% essentially of a marathon. Then – when you put that in perspective, how would you train for something like this? Because like I think about the time it takes from just running and trying to work up to a marathon, which is only 40 odd Ks. And when I say only, that is a big chunk. Let's make that clear. But when I say only, it's because I'm comparing it now to what you guys are doing. And that's so much more. How do you train for something like that? Uh, I think it's like you've got, you're you're training your endurance, not obviously for speed so much, and there's a lot of mental training because of these hills. They're they're only short, like they might be a a k or a k and a half or two at the most, and then you're going back down, and then you go back up, and that it's just that relentless push of one or two k's up, one or two k's down, but they're really steep. So I believe it's going to be more of a mental game mostly, um, and knowing look I've finished 100 kilometers i've finished 100 miles i've done you know 20 marathons in the last six months or something beforehand so you know you can do it you've just got to believe in yourself and then once you believe in yourself you can actually achieve more man hats off to people doing it out there because it's i i'm always fat i'm a pe teacher so i love anything to do with sport and athletics and all that and for me just listening and going wow that is such a I can't even fathom doing it you know my best mate and I were looking at doing a um, one up here in Sydney and it's it's a combo so you've got uh, 24 hours to finish a a run a cycle and a kayak and um, I can't remember the name of it but that was very enticing and I think we're still looking at doing that so when I'm thinking about these things going, okay, that 24 hours, yeah, you know what, that would be tough, but I can see it being achievable. Then thinking about 56 hours and going, oh my God, that is that is punishment and that is a lot of punishment because if you're going up and down all day, I know what I feel like after a couple of days of walking it with a pack when I'm out hunting. I can't yeah. even imagine what it'd be like just running up and down that all day for a couple of days. <laughs> it's insane. Oh, no. Yeah. 
I think a lot of the biggest complaints are like, oh, for sore feet, things like that. It's hard to train for a 56 hour event, obviously. Yep. You can't really, you don't want to burn yourself out before the actual thing. But yeah, like you said, it, it, it is a big mental game. You will finish. There is an end. Even when you're, in, you're going through a hard, hard slog, you're like, no, nah, if I just keep moving forward, you know, it'll, I'll get there eventually. Just, yeah, believing that you can keep doing it, I think. I think that's a good message and good key is that the human body is so amazing and you can do so much that you don't think you can do it. I've found that out a few times throughout my life. How did this start? It just seems such a, a big niche sort of thing, like a big thing to do, but such a small niche of people who would be participating in something like this. Where did the idea come from to get it cracking up here in Australia? We had uh, four mates sort of, we're all just sort of trail running at the back of Lady Derg or in Wombat State Forest there. And then we sort of were just chatting away, oh, wouldn't it be great to put on an event, you know, 100Ks or 80Ks. And, and so one, one of us mentioned, what about 135 like miles? Well, I think he's met, he said 135Ks or 180Ks or something just to be a little bit different to the to the others. And then it, it came out that there was a few 135 miles races around the world and that kind of seemed like it was – the the new thing with there had been a lot of 100k runs yep around the place and then it was coming out that there was 100 milers so just that little bit more yeah just to be to be different uh, and it so far it's worked pretty well so there's uh, plenty of space out there to try and add oh well, we can change it every year so plenty of trails that we can sort of mix and match and the boys have been out there mapping it for years now. So even if like we get some bad weather sometimes, so we might want to take out like a, a, a section that we run through is an, an old river or that they call it old river trail. It's like a dry Creek bed. Yep. And it's just wall to wall. Uh, is it, you got a vertical straight down. Then there's a river, old dry Creek rock, and then a wall straight up. Like it, it's pretty impossible to, sort of go left or right and we'll get lost out of there. But when it rains, it gets pretty slippery and dangerous yeah. and stuff. So um, there has been a year or two that we've sort of managed around that area just to make sure that we're looking after the runners that are still going. So you do it as well, mate? I haven't done this full one. I do – I've done all sorts of different bits and parts. Uh, my biggest run is about 100 kilometres. Yep, which is still massive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a good day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I haven't I haven't done it myself fully, but um, I've ran across nearly every part of this the course. Um, Just in the sections. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. mate, how do you go with wildlife out on the track? Do you see much when you're running around? I know I've got a few mates that are dirt bike riders, and they. Yeah see a heap of animals when they're out there and about. Has there been any, um, you know, cool stories as you're running around bumping into things? As we, yeah, I've seen uh, plenty of goats, uh, wombats, roos, obviously, kidnas. I haven't come across too many deer, uh, although I've heard that they're around. The other boys have come across some pigs and they've named like a, a gully that they now run through after like a pig alley kind of thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. I think just getting out in the bush is always a win and I am a big advocate. I don't really care what you want to do out there as long as it's legal, obviously, but whether it be hunting, whether it be running, whether it be riding bikes, full driving, I think they're all really positive from a mental health perspective and yeah. basically just getting out of the cities, getting out of our suburban lives and getting – into nature because I think we really have lost a part of ourselves as humans being so detached now from the bush. So it's um, it's always a good one. And it's really curious because I've heard some really good stories of people being out there, not hunting, not even looking for animals and just coming across a heap and having yeah. those experiences. I sit there and go, damn, I wish I was out there with a rifle where you can, obviously. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, uh, I know on in 
one of the parks you can't and one side you can, but a lot of the wildlife that we see that you can hunt is uh, not in the right spot. So <laughs> That's always the way. They're pretty tricky like that. So <laughs> They know where to go. They do indeed. So, mate, you said you did a bit of hunting as well growing up? Yeah, uh, I sort of grew up with firearms in the house and uh, get up around, you know, like growing up with it. So um, dad used to always go out with the – pop and go duck shooting every year or get away for some the odd pig hunt um but never really got into it until i was probably uh, in my late teens uh, you know as soon as you could get your firearms license so i did um get into archery probably when i was 16 i was like oh, i want to get out hunting so convinced the school PE teacher to loan me out a bow so I could shoot in the backyard. Yep. We had a big backyard growing up so I could do all that fun stuff, sort of figure out how to use those little recurves in the right way and not the wrong way. Yep. A bit of a, bit of a fun fun thing and then was able to eventually get a, get a got compound, join the club that was out there and you got pretty, pretty good. Um, ended up winning a... I think, I believe it was a B grade for the year ones. Yeah, wow. And then after that, was invited out on a few different hunts, and it was just mostly on on goats and things. So, yeah, uh, goats have been a bit pretty staple kind of hunt kind of thing for me. And they're good meat. I love eating goat. I uh, oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's uh, it really just intrigues me here in Australia how the most consumed meat in the world being goat. Is and we've got a lot of them, and they're free range. And yeah. even our type of country where they do really well in arid parts, and we've got some arid parts of this country. Let's you know, let's be honest. And it's not our go-to. It really, I don't understand yeah. why. And we'll run sheep and lamb, and I've got no issue with sheep and lamb. I love eating lamb, and you know that. I, I even you know will eat mutton and, and the like. But yep. for me, I don't see a big difference, or maybe it's just my palate, but I don't taste a big difference, I should say, with goat and lamb. It, yeah. you know, if, you, if you prep it well and, and cut it up well and you've got good knife handling skills and you look after it, you can't tell. I, I know I got a couple last year and I gave some back to the farmer and they could not believe – they, they thought I'd literally gone out and bought lamb. Uh, they yeah. could not believe it was goat. And I was like, oh, that's it. And they keep some goats too as, as pets. Yeah. So obviously I didn't shoot their pets. But um, <laughs> that was, you know, for me, I just, yeah, just it really intrigues me sometimes how we are in this country and how that came about. And like everything, I suppose, there's everybody likes different things and I get that. There's not too many people out there that are probably wanting to run 135 miles. I, no, no. <laughs> I, uh, I, my hat goes off to those who do because that's just it's a, an insane amount of, there must be, well, A, mental fortitude, resilience, preparation, dedication, time, Man, that's just such a, you know, I, I sometimes struggle finding, you know, 45 minutes to get up to my gym and I sort of sit there and it's something that I'm passionate about and I love doing. Yeah. And then I go something that, you know, to prep for that, whilst, yes, you can't be running 135 miles each week, you still would have to be clocking up some decent kilometres to be able to comfortably do one of those. Yeah, I've, I believe, I think I've got, I've got too many hobbies to be solely focused on it really um and then especially through covid i've sort of lost lost a bit of love of it of the sport but not fully still trying to get back to it probably didn't help that a few injuries have had come up and stuff sort of snuck in but um once i sort of get back onto that or over those i'll be sort of getting back into it and then also trying to get back into hunting as well so i've got a my youngest is actually showing a bit of interest in wanting to get back into or start getting into into hunting. So yeah, well, like, oh, dad, I want to get a deer with my bow. I'm like, um, <laughs> let me get one first, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I uh, 
I've only just got my first deer. I shouldn't say that like only now because it's a new year. So I got yeah. a deer last year, I should say. It sounds a lot better. It doesn't matter that it was late in the year, but um, – that was with the rifle and there oh, I've got the same goal is that I want to get one with the bow at some stage. Um, I think yeah. I need to get a hell of a lot better as a hunter uh, before that happens. But it's, I think it's the challenge and whether it be hunting or whether it be something like DU-135, it's the challenge and for a lot of people that that resonates with them and they want to do that. And I you, what you were saying there really hit home with me about having too many hobbies and that's that's me. I have way too many hobbies and it's hard to find the time for all of them and, you know, it's, it's a real tricky one because to be really good at one of them, you need to sort of drop the others but I enjoy all of it so I don't really want to drop any of them and I'm yeah. sort of happy to sacrifice being really, really good at – one thing to be average or a bit better than average at a lot of them, if that makes yeah. sense. Like yeah. I, I don't want to miss out on running and I don't want to miss out on going to the gym or fishing or um, hiking. I love my hiking. I don't want to miss out on those as well. So it's that real tricky thing. And what I try and do now is try and get ones that complement each other. So yeah. for my hunting, when I go for a it run – yeah, exactly. So that there's some sort of synergy between them because if I can go for a, yeah, or cross training. Yeah, well, exactly, cross training. If if I can run and or I can go for hikes with my pack and that's going to then make it easier when I'm hiking around the mountains chasing an animal. That's perfect because they're offsetting each other. One that I'm enjoying is almost training for the other and that's something I've sort of looked at. Now there are a few in there that, you know, that don't exactly link up, such as, you know, my golf and things like that. So that, that's a bit different. You've got another day off. Well, so, you know, I talk about being a PE teacher and talk about training and we talk about the principles of training. And one of those principles is obviously there's specificity, which is specifically training for your, your activity. And then there's variety. And for me, that is a big key. If you can get some variety so it's not getting stale. I really don't think there's anything out there that if you were to do it all day, every day, you would lose the passion for doing it. And yeah. I know a lot of people and a lot of people say that I don't hunt enough and I'm sort of like a part-time hunter. And no, that's cool. I get that. And for me, I don't see that as a bad thing because I don't need to be super successful. If I harvest a deer to get some meat, I'm super happy. If I don't, I'm really happy being out in the bush and the experience of it anyway. And on top of that is that when I do get the chance to go out there, I'm just like a little kid opening presents at Christmas. I'm sitting yep. there going, oh, my God, you know, the night before I can't fall asleep because I really want to get out there. For me, that's important and – I have met a lot of people over, you know, my life that have done activities and they've done them every single day and then all of a sudden it's just, it's monotonous. They don't like it. They don't enjoy it. It becomes a chore. And, yeah. you know, I've even spoke to some colours that they they don't really enjoy hunting or pulling the trigger because they've killed thousands of animals and they're, you know, they know that it's got to be done and there's, you know, they're doing it for pest control and the like, but they get over it. And it's yeah, a job. It becomes a job. Yeah. And I'm not about that. That, you know, at the end of the day, for me, it's about the passion. It's about the experience. I'm, you know, I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to be famous. It's something that for me, just getting out there and having fun and learning about a new skill, trying to get better at that skill. Um, I'm not in a rush. I don't need to be the best hunter next year. If I keep making mistakes and keep learning, that's part of the joy of hunting for me. And, yeah. you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to talk to guys like Jim Shockey and world-renowned hunter, multiple TV shows. And talking to him, you know, he, he was telling me that he was away from his family 300 odd days, 320 days a year, um, I think he yeah. said. And I – Oh man, it's a chunk. I wouldn't want to do that. I have zero interest in that. I love hunting, but I don't want to miss out on my family. And you know, credit to him. And it's just not for me. Yeah, I think for hunting for you, it sounds more like you want to go out to get meat 
to provide for the family. So it's for the family. It's not to be away from the family. Yeah, hundred percent. I can't wait. Like you, when you were talking about your son's showing interest, I my ears were perking up. Like, oh, sorry, your daughter. My ears were perking up. Going, man, I can't wait till I get to that stage in life because I've only got little, little ones. My, you know, I've got one and a half year old yeah. twins, and then I've got a three and a half year old son, and so they're little, little. They're only just like my oldest is just. Well, he's showing a lot of interest in fishing, which is fantastic. Yeah, uh, awesome makes a lot of noise out the bush. So I sort of sit there and go, ah, oh, you know, I'm not even a great hunter yet. I, I can't sort of hinder myself and take him out there to make it harder. So uh, Train him on fishing. Well, you know what? I'm very big on as long as they have some sort of passion for the outdoors, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, that's a win because in this day and age with technology, with internet, with games, I want them exposed to those sort of things. They have to be or they're going to be at a disadvantage in the world. But I also yeah. want them to be able to have that passion to be able to come outside and go camping and hunting and yeah, fishing yeah. and whatever they want to do, to be honest. If they don't want to do any of that, I'm not going to force them. But I really want to do my best to make sure that they do like the outdoors in some capacity. And, hey, who knows, if they're doing something like DU-135 and they hate hunting, I won't be upset about that. <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah. you know, as long as they have that, that goal that it relates to positive outcomes, that's a win as a father for me. Mate, I just, yeah, for me, I sit there and go props to you and your mates for starting something like this because it must be a lot of effort to get up and running, as you said, mapping out all these different areas and, and whatnot. Yeah. I had a question about how contestants run on it. Do you ha- do they have to have map skills? Like do they need to know how to read a map? Um, Is it a laid out course? That's a bloody long course to lay out markers. <laughs> it's an out and back. Okay. So uh, on the, the same course that you go out, the same course you come back on, in on, just in reverse. But the so there is – we make like a, a – PDF map that they can download, uh, and then we use an app called like Maps Maps dot Me. Okay. Yep. That they'll they'll put on onto that, and they can always just check uh, that as they they go along. It's kind of like a Advenza. Yeah, I was going to say Advenza. A lot of hunters use that. Yeah, but uh, this one you well, you can use um, it's slightly better than Advenza in a way that um, if you go off the map, it still tells you where you are. So. You know how Advenza, if you go off a PDF map and you, you go go too far, yep, you still it's kind of like a, a Google Google Maps, but then uh, it's just not in like there's no satellite image. Um, okay, yep, yeah, you'll be able to still see where you are and go. Oh crap, I've got to go back a k or two. I've missed a turn, and and it, and it still lets you see um, where the next aid station is and all those kind of things. So. Yeah, it works out pretty well. Uh, a lot of people have started to adopt that, I think, as their running map, just because you can also use it all on airplane mode once it's downloaded. Yep. So like a Venza. Yeah. Save the battery. Yeah. Yeah, it works pretty well. Um, otherwise, map skills, um, pretty much we don't really have to say that, that you need map skills. Um, we do like them to have a map of the area just in case everything goes wrong. And then we do have not so much a breadcrumb trail, but a we'll always have markers at any intersecting or you know, when well, they might be two, three hundred meters apart. Okay. Not every thirty meters there's a there's a marker. Yeah. So there's multiple fail safes for people just so they don't get lost. Yeah, and they've all got trackers as well. So, um, yeah, we can. Everyone's being watched. And then we've had multiple times where like a partner that is – we've had a US runner come, come along and his partner's back home and she's messaged the messages on Facebook saying, hey, he hasn't moved in two hours. What's going on? He's like, oh, yep, well, we've checked it out. He's all right. We've, he's actually pulled out and um, getting checked by the medics and, and things like that. So it sort of keeps everyone – fairly what would you say like calm about yeah. the whole thing yeah it's good yeah i'm a big proponent of safety first and i i have some mates that do a lot of bushcraft and they uh they will go 
And it's almost like the alone style sort of stuff that they'll just get dumped into an area for a decent amount of time. And for me, I love the idea of it, but it makes me very nervous at how quickly something can go wrong and you don't foresee it and you just then could be in a lot of trouble. So I, uh, we've been talking for a while trying to make this happen. And, you know, crazy time of year coming into Christmas and the like. And I had a trip up to the families in Queensland. My parents live up there. <laughs> and so it's a big drive. I've got, and with toddlers, it's uh, probably too big a drive. But it was 16 hours it took us to get up there on the first day. At about 30 minutes away from their house, I started feeling crook. And just was like, oh, my stomach, that doesn't feel right. And I said to the wife, I said, I don't, I don't feel great. So we got there and, and packed the car as, as quick as I sort of could. And I sat down and just went, oh, I'm really, I'm not, not feeling great at all. That followed by probably 16 hours straight of just vomiting and diary. And then the next day my parents got it. Uh, so my, I think my dad got it, then my mum got it, then my wife got it, and it just it went through all of us over a period of like four or five days. So uh, yeah. Christmas Day was a write-off. No one was wanting to eat. I think my wife was the only one that ate. Uh, so it was, yeah. it was such a write-off. And that always, things like that, that are just unexpected, unforeseen, no idea where we got this bug from. I'm guessing probably one of my kids from daycare, but – it was just something that I'm, I cannot, can't imagine people just going out into the bush for eight days and potentially not being in contact because some of my mates have done that, which is even scarier, and not having sort of a device to get out. That worries me because it just takes something like that. And I know how I was feeling, how dehydrated I was, and I was lucky enough that I was at a house where I could have access to a lot of different things. I couldn't imagine being out in the bush and something like that happened and not having the right gear. So when we talk about safety, it's a big one for me. And it's, I'm glad to hear those multiple steps that you have for the competitors yeah. in the race so that everybody's tracked, everybody's safe, everybody has multiple fail safes that they're not going to get too lost. But on getting lost, oh, my God, I – doing 135 miles and then taking a wrong turn and having to do an extra one or two, oh, that would suck. Yeah. That, that, I think that's where the mental thing must come in, that you're sitting there going, oh, my God, now I've got to just add it to it because I made a mistake. Uh, that's, that's insane. Yeah, I, I remember doing getting uh, lost in one of my bigger, bigger races at Mount Buffalo and uh, I, was, I was listening to somebody else and they said, oh, there's a marker down there. And I'm like, oh, like for those that have done it, or are familiar with it, that there's uh, just out of Bright, there's a mountain called Clear Spot. And we'd come back from Mount Buffalo, come across, I think it's, I've forgotten what valley it was, but we've gone up Clear Spot and down the other side. And we're, we're meant to turn right where it used to go through, or I'm not sure if it still does, the uh, uh, mountain bike park. And you go through this mountain bike park, follow the trails down there, and then down into Bright. Somebody that I was running with had said, "Oh, there's a marker down further down." I, like, I think we've gone past past the turn off. Like, no, there's there's a marker. So I listened to him, and then that that's taken a, a 75k finish to a, a 78, and I'd lost just enough time to sort of I lost a bit of my goal. Yeah, my goal time that I was aiming for. And I'm like, oh, come on, man! Like, really? I listened to somebody else when I should have trusted myself. So, um, yeah, getting lost is, kind of sucks, but you still get there in the end, uh, which is the main main thing. So you said you did 100 k How long yeah. did that take you? Uh, 15 hours. What kind of pace are you running at? What's that, 15? I, I can't remember. <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, Seven-minute Ks? Seven-minute Ks is pretty impressive for – a long period of time. Yeah, well, I was a lot fitter. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, well, the winners, the, I think the winner that year did the 100K in just under eight or just over eight hours. Holy crap. So he, yeah, he can fly. Um, well, that's like that new, which isn't the new marathon record, the bloke ran it in under two hours. Uh, yeah. I'm I think- pretty confident he ran it in like an hour and 58. Now they're talking about – actually, that's a good one. 
They're talking about technology and running shoes being this, um, I guess, really making it an advantage for runners. Is there much of that going on in sort of the ultra marathon scene? Not really. No. Nah. Not really? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, it's not so much about speed because you've got the distance. It's just, it's just impossible to keep up the speed. And you, you know, talk, especially the lengths of over 100 kilometres, it's like there'll be some advantage to good technology in shoes, but um, you're just going to physically just going to be tired. And it's just going to be, you're going for just too long for what any advantage might, might give you, I think. I, um, so I just had to look it up because I was, it was bugging me. I was like, I'm sure that I heard that someone ran one under two hours and they did, they ran it and it was an hour and 59 minutes, 40 to do right. 42 kilometers. That's all my, like, that is absolutely insane. It didn't actually classify because uh, it's not a world record or anything because it wasn't on a record eligible course. Yeah. So I was like, oh, that's devastating. But, I mean, I then went, okay, well, what's the record? And it was set in Chicago and it was at, <laughs> oh, this is insane, two hours and 35. But to give you an understanding of the pace, it's four minutes 36 per mile. Yeah. Like, when you okay, so what a mile is one point six one kilometers. So let's just call it one and a half for, yeah, it's for about shits and giggles. Two, that's two nearly, thirty, I think. Yeah, two minutes thirty to three minutes a kilometer. That far out. I think my best pace ever was just under five minutes per one uh, yeah. per for one kilometer, and they're doing like two minutes off that. But for forty two of them, it's man, it's insane. I. Uh, uh, it fascinates me. And then when you start to even talk about slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers and the genetic makeup of different people, and that's it's one of the beautiful things about sport that I love and things like the ultra marathon is that there's so many elements to it. You spoke about, you know, athletic ability has to be one, training, mental aptitude, being able to get through those hard times and keep going and even yeah. just setting yourself that goal and sticking to it. Like it's New Year's at the moment. The gyms are flooded with people that are New Year, New Me, and, you know, that's probably got another week before that ends and um, the <laughs> gyms go back to normal. But for people to really stick it out and keep going, especially when times get tough, it's a really great thing and I think that everyone needs to do something like that at least, at least once in their life and hopefully continue with it to keep yeah. getting better as a person. It is, it's out there um, to like, just to, to try and get for a marathon. Uh, yeah. Even I, I tell everyone just try and go for a trail marathon. It's easier on the body. It, it's, it's more like a party kind of thing at the back and there's, there's less time pressures. Um, yeah. If you're running on concrete, oh, it just hurts. Yeah. But yeah, if you can get on out on the trails and, run especially like if you're interested in seeing the wildlife or you know potential hunting spots and things like that like you can go scope out an area pretty quick and if you're running through you, you go oh well, i just saw a rub as you're running past or something so you might be able to put that in the phone as a, and save that spot come back to it um another time so that's a really good point, and there's one I just found out uh, probably just uh, one of my last hunts, and it's just taking a photo, and then you can upload that photo to, say, Avenza, yeah. and it will automatically save the coordinates as well. Yep. You've got this essentially great little resource that tells you, hey, Here's a photo of what happened. Here's the GPS coordinates. So if you're out on a run, you see something like that, you can grab a quick happy snap, even if it's not the exact area, but it will give you the the pinpoint location so you know roughly where that was. So you're sort of yeah. combining your fitness and running as well as, you know, scouting, which that's, that's really good. There's also another one, um, Google Photos app does something very similar. So when you take that, it will uh, include usually the GPS coordinates so you can overlay yep. that and have that. So there's a couple of different services out there that do it and that's a win. So it makes life a lot easier than yeah. having to drop pins and things like that. Just take a quick happy snap, keep going and um, happy days. You're sort of, you're yeah. scouting, you're doing some exercise, maybe training for a run, 
that's that's a win-win. Uh, I know a few people that do that, that they go out in the state forests and they run through them and all public land and that's a bit of training for fitness. But while they're doing it, they're also taking note of what they're seeing, if they're bumping anything and that then helps out their hunting as well. So it's sort of that win-win win i suppose there's so many uh positive aspects out of doing something like that yeah but i know um also if you've got like uh, i've got a samsung so i know i can save whenever i take a picture i can save the gps point to it so it's just one of the settings in in the background okay so, um yeah you can i can go back through all my pictures i can see oh yeah i took that over near the beach or down the river or whatever so yeah i think most of the phones nowadays are going to be coming out with that GPS location of where you can take it. And sometimes they, they do a, oh, look, you took a trip around this area and they they show you a highlight reel kind of thing. Uh, yep, yep, I've heard. I haven't had that on mine. I've got an Apple, but I, uh, I'm, I don't know if it can do it or not, but I have seen people say that, yeah, they've done that like a, uh, a reel and all the different, like a slideshow for them. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Tech's getting so crazy. I've been, look, as I said, I love running. So I, one of the things I am frustrated a little bit about where I live is I don't have street lights. And so, it, you know, with kids, does it, it's not conducive to getting out for a run at the appropriate daylight hours sometimes. Yeah. And not having street lights, I've tried running with all the different headlamps and I am not a massive fan of running it on the headlamp. It just bounces around. I don't thoroughly enjoy it. So yeah. I've been just going, all right, well, I've got a treadmill here, but I hate running on treadmills. Even watching a TV, it's not. It's just something I don't like doing. I'd rather be running around somewhere just to see the different change of scenery. Um, but then I was just having a quick look and seeing all these new curved bloody treadmills and all the new tech coming out in some of them and go oh my god how yeah. how crazy is this getting <laughs> there's just so much now and it's so affordable for people to be able to to get whatever they need to train or, or whatnot even changing your styles i believe those curved ones are, are designed so that you're running more on your toes and it makes it easier for for you to run on your toes at faster speeds and things like that so it's it's pretty cool when you think about all these technological advancements that are helping in a variety of ways of life. Yeah. Yeah, that midfoot strike's probably the best or m- sort of more of a most efficient. Um, but those treadmills, they've been around for a little while now and they're just becoming a lot more popular. Um, yeah. I think COVID sort of just sort of pushed all that treadmill stuff up, like the technology or people to think about them. Like, how can we make this better? If we can't go anywhere, I've got to make this one better. So they had no choice. Yeah, I think you're right there. I know for me, I was pretty lucky. I was one of the lucky ones in COVID because I already had the home gym. And yeah. there was a uh, – I, I ended up selling a couple of different things and went, geez, I, I think I sold them for a lot more than what I paid because it was just supply and demand was insane because all of yeah. a sudden all the guys that were really – I remember selling a leg press – wasn't a great leg press. I wasn't super happy with it. So I was just like, oh, look, I might put it up, see if anyone's interested and just got bombarded because all these yeah. guys that are, are massive gym junkies when it was all lockdowns, they couldn't get to the gym and they were like, I don't want to lose all this hard work. So they were just trying to grab whatever they could. Yeah. There is that component of it now that the pricing, when you actually do the calculations, I I'd still can – the only reason I think gyms are still so prevalent is the fact that people's space at home is so probably poor nowadays in yeah. such, you know, smaller houses and smaller blocks. But the reality is the cost of things now, you could deck out and have your full gym at home and you're going to save a hell of a lot of money compared to gym membership fees. But it's that space, which is probably at a premium. But if you've got that space, geez, there's some good gear now and it's there's so much of it. I mean, even the dumbbells – the I uh, can't remember what they're called, but the ones that they click and they got plates on them. So yep. you can get like a 24 kilo or a 48 kilo and it basically is just two dumbbells and it has your whole range of weights. Now, they've been around for a bloody long time, but things like that, you can sort of get everything you need to have at home very, yep. very quickly, very, very um, – you know, and they're not that expensive. I think they're like five hundred dollars off the top of my head, and you sit there and go, "Wow, five hundred bucks!" So only really a few, you know, a couple months of um, gym membership, isn't it? What? Yeah, usually, the, you know, like you said, 
people are going to forget about it, that they're a member of the gym and forget to cancel and they've already they've wasted a couple hundred dollars. Like, oh, yep. oh, yeah, I've got to go and get that. So. Well, the one for me is traveling there. If you're not close to a gym, I've never sort of lived in the areas I've lived. They've never been real close to a gym. So um, the last house I lived in, it was like a 25-minute drive to the gym. This one here is probably about 15. And by the time you're there and back, it's like 30 minutes, man. I can do, if I've got everything at home, I can do a 30, 45 minute workout and that's just the traveling time. Like it, it that just, especially yeah. as you get time poor when you have kids and the like. So it's sort of that, that trade off, which you're th- sort of looking at and going, which is the best way to proceed here. But it, it is hard to motivate too. Like yeah. I know there's some people out there and again, we, we come back to, to people that do things like the DU 135. That is tough. There is a lot of people out there that will never do that because they can't motivate themselves like there's some people that can't motivate themselves to work out you know yeah. i see that all the time and people need a pt and, and not dissing pts by any stretch of the imagination they do a great job especially for people that need them so yeah. when you're looking at it going hey some people need it some people don't some people like working out in groups some people like to work out on their own and it comes back to hunting being in the outdoors some people love solo camping some people love to go out camp with mates it, it's Everyone needs to do something that they enjoy and that's the big sort of message that I really want coming out of this podcast is that do what you love and find things that are outside your comfort zone that you enjoy and that keep you learning and keep you outside and keep you being healthy. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy thing that uh, getting outside sometimes it feels impossible. You, you get stuck in the, the you know, rigmarole of just keeping up life with home and kids and back and forth to work. Like I do shift work, so it gets in the way as well. Um, I'll, I'll watch, oh, yeah, I want to be, do this race next year or in, in a couple of months, and then I'll go forward and see where my schedule is. And like, oh, great, I'm already working. And, like, yeah. Yeah, and then do I take a Saturday or a Sunday off and then lose that Saturday-Sunday benefit like in, in the pay? You know, uh, so you, sometimes you've got to juggle what you want what you need to do but also then trying to take opportunities like because i do the shift work i can get out during the week when nobody else is going so usually the trails are free or um or you know they're not it's easy to get a car park at the trailhead kind of thing yeah things little things like that i know i've got to take more advantage of those as well but i think life just gets in the way and that's why i don't really ever put people down and if they don't get out hunting enough or that they do or you know, everyone has to make their own choices, but um, what suits me and what is right for me and my fam- my family and I, I should say, what yeah. suits me and what's right for my family and I is not going to be the same for somebody else. And, you know, that's that's everybody's, you know, prerogative. They've got to make those decisions and what they, what's important to them and what they do. So, mate, I'm glad we chatted because I had you know, uh, when I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, that's why I messaged you straight away going, I, I want to hear more about this because it fascinates me. Uh, it's probably not something I'll ever achieve in my life and well, the that's two, cool. I- the two winners of, of the first, we had joint winners. Um, yep. They crossed line together. They were like 60, man. So what? Never never underestimate yourself. It's uh, Yeah, right. Uh, Ultra marathoning is more... It's not a young person's game. You obviously got a bit of build up to get into it, but there's it's always generally you see from your your thirty fives, forties, and fifty year olds are the the main people that do it. So yeah, right. Because you got that slower pace, I believe. So yeah, it's nothing to say. Never say never. <laughs> Thank you for that because you've now motivated me. I did legs yesterday at gym and they are hurting today and I was going to go for a run. I had it planned to go for a run today and I was like, oh, geez, my legs are sore. Maybe I'll push it to tomorrow. But I think now I'll do it today because <laughs> if we got 60-year-olds out there running 135 miles, I probably can't use the excuse that my legs are a bit sore from gym. So yeah. <laughs> that's that's a good thing coming out of our conversation but uh mate i really appreciate your time coming on having a chat best of luck getting back into bow hunting and and taking out the daughter and and hope that uh you know you get some great memories of that 
Love the uh, the thing, and who knows, we might meet one day, and and I'll be down there doing it because if other people uh, are a lot older than me, can maybe I do need to have a crack and start thinking about something like this seriously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for inviting me along. So it's been great. Appreciate it, man. So thank you for your time, and listeners, bye for now. If you have a topic, guest, question, or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast, shoot us an email, australianhuntingandbeyond at gmail.com. Alternatively, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.